Sean, I'm feeling good. I've been back from Vegas for a few days now. We had a great player media tour there. You, on the other hand, said you're running a little rugged here because after Las Vegas, Sean, you went out to L.A., El Segundo in particular, and did the Rookie Showcase event there. I did, and it was fantastic. There's so much good young talent coming into the league. You know, Celebrini only played in one of San Jose's three games, and they still scored 17 goals. They have a ton of young guys coming into into their program. It was the first time Seattle ever played in a rookie tournament. Um, you know, they have some good players coming up. Cutter Gautier was there, 20 pounds heavier, um, and he was not eating pizza and ice cream, I asked. He was actually eating healthy food, and he looks like a tank. He looks ready for the NHL. It was all awesome until I tried to get home, and then it was a 14-hour travel day. And I know nobody wants to hear about my sad sack travel days, but trying to get back on East Coast after a 14-hour travel day and a week out West, a little rugged. And then you ate all the pizza and ice cream that Cutter Gautier wasn't eating. No, no. I ate all <laughs> the burritos that I could while I was there. <laughs> That's what you do. It's great that we're back doing this. We Listen, training camps open this week. Players are, we, we know the players have been on the ice for a while now, but official in an official capacity with training camps opening a little later on this week, we're recording this Tuesday, and there's been a lot of news already. There will be a lot more news coming a little later on in this episode. We spoke with Leon Dreisaitl at Player Media Tour. Player Media Tour was fantastic, by the way. We got a bunch of interviews that we're going to be playing over the next several weeks. So we spoke with Leon Dreisaitl there. We also spoke with Bill Daly. We're going to have both of those interviews. Leon talking about his love of Edmonton, the Oilers' culture, his friendship with McDavid, losing in the cup final. Bill Daly on on the business of the game, on Utah, on Ovechkin and Crosby. By the way, 20th season for them coming up and their impact on the game. So all that's coming up in this episode. But to me, the two biggest pieces of news, Sean, Sidney Crosby signing his contract, Lucas Raymond signing his. There's still more. There's still more. As we speak right now, Tuesday morning, Jeremy Swayman is a restricted free agent still. The Bruins need their goalie in camp. Mo Sider from Detroit remains a restricted free agent. But I wanted to start, Sean, with Sidney Crosby. Another two-year deal coming up for him, so that means three more years at Crosby, and of course, an $8.7 million AAV on Crosby, which has been his AAV since 2008-09. I think they should retire that number in the salary cap. I think they should retire it in the arena. Just put well, an eight point seven, eighty-seven up on a flat, uh, on a banner, and then eight point seven next to it. Because when you think about it, you know, you said how long it's been, and then extrapolate the amount of money that's been left on the table, right? You're talking $50 million minimum. That's just a conservative estimate that he saved the Pittsburgh Penguins, that he said, you don't have to pay me what my market worth is. Go invest in other things for the organization. I want us to be successful. Like... That's as big a legacy as Mario Lemieux when it comes to the financial health of the Pittsburgh Penguins. I know I don't say it all the time because I don't agree with you all the time, but you're 100% right. He's left a lot of money on the table, and that's how you stay relevant. That's how you win in a cap era. This guy came in in the cap era, 05, 06, and so that's what he's known. Yeah, it's you know 8.7. The number itself means that a lot like love something as much as Sidney Crosby loves the numbers eight and seven together it's I don't know that you can uh it is his birthday eight seven eight seven eight seven eighty seven but the amount of money he's left on the table for other guys is a reason why Evgeny Malkin has been there his whole career it's a reason why Chris Letang has been there his whole career and it's a big reason why they've been able to continue to stay relevant winning the Stanley Cup three times being in the cup final four times. Uh, and now it's the challenge of getting back to the playoffs that they've missed the past two years. But Sean, the captain's bought in. And if the captain's bought in, and and he's to me a top five player of all time in this league, and we can have that argument if you want, but I think he's a top five player of all time. 
then everybody else should be bought in. The coach has got, there's continuity there. I don't know if they have enough. I specifically don't know if they have enough in net, but you're going to get another couple of years of relevancy from the Pittsburgh Penguins because we know the hard times are coming, right? They're going to be there eventually when this era is done, but the era is not done yet because Sidney Crosby says, I got more in me. I got three more years at least in me. He's got one year left on his deal and two more coming. Big contract. I I, I think it's a, just a terrific signing and a team-friendly signing for a team-friendly guy. It's amazing that at the age he is, at the number he signed for, that we're talking about it being a team-friendly contract. But it truly is. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, he was, he was what, top 15 in scoring last year? And, and you know, that, the going rate for that, clearly is is higher right you see the dry cycle signing recently and and look there's more than a decade difference in in their ages um so i, I understand that but you know the, my favorite Sidney crosby thing is that he says he's not superstitious yeah right <laughs> 8.7 come on <laughs> um but it, it's it's awesome yeah i actually have a question for you all right so if Sidney crosby was 10 years younger is he signing for eight point seven million? No, he's signing for eighteen point seven million. <laughs> or he's signing like the like a eighty seven million over you know four years or something like that, right? Yeah. Like, but it, it it is an interesting question because he he's been playing. This was a twelve year deal that he signed in two thousand and eight. Um, I'm sorry uh, that he it was a twelve year deal that he's coming off of. Uh, not the one he signed away. It's a 12-year deal he's coming off of. And that at the time was the going rate. It was, a, you know, it was like, okay, where the cap was and the percentage of the cap. I don't exactly know where he was on the percentage of the cap, but it was about right. Now he's 37 years old and he's still a top player in the league. With the numbers that he puts up and the impact that he has on the ice, it is a bargain for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And Sean... I don't think it's ever not going to be a bargain in the in the remainder of this of his career because the way he conditions himself, the way he trains, the way he, the impact he can make in the game, that's going to continue. He'll get old, but I still think he's going to have I think Sidney Crosby's has a realization that he can continue to make this impact for three more seasons. And that's why he signed the two-year extension. That's why it wasn't a four-year extension or a three-year extension. I think I can go for three more at this level. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to reduce his level and just hang on. He can play at this level for three more years. I don't doubt anything. If you told me that Sidney Crosby could play at this level for six more years, I'd probably buy into that. I, I, I think you know part of it is he doesn't want to hamstring the Penguins. Right, these are over thirty-five deals. There's all kinds of things that go into that, as far as what the cap implications are and everything else. So um, you don't want to tie to a player, whoever it is, long term post thirty-five. You know, we talked about him taking less money. He he's always kind of put himself in a position where the franchise comes first, and it's just not money wise. I mean, it goes all the way back. I, I don't know if you remember, um, you know, when they were at the height of their powers in the Stanley Cup finals, and, and Sid would talk almost every day, but never at the podium. Oh, yeah. Never at the podium because he didn't want to put himself above the team. So we all climbed on yeah. top of lockers and pushed people and everything else to get his pearls of wisdom. But he wasn't going to go to the podium because he didn't want to be bigger than anybody else on the team. Like, that's just the way that he thinks, and it permeates everything he does. And, and it's been the identity of that franchise for, you know, 20 years now. It's part of his legend. It's a big part of his legacy. 8.7 is a big number. Uh, that Retire it. Nobody should have... Nobody should be allowed to have an 8.7 million AAV on their contract ever again. Retire the number. Lucas Raymond. <laughs> Think about this. Lucas Raymond is 22 years old. He gets the eight-year deal, $64.6 million from the Detroit Red Wings. That's $8.075 million on the AAV. Crosby's you know, only making $625,000 more per year than Lucas Raymond, who's 22 and is coming off a really good season with 72 points and has never made the playoffs. I got to be honest with you, Sean. I, I think Lucas Raymond's a, a very good player and will be an impact player 
for a long time, I was surprised at the number. I, I, I was surprised. I thought the number for him would fall in the sixes or the sevens on an AAV, even if it was a shorter term. I didn't expect to get to get up to eight. Well, I think it's the back end of the deal, right? You talked about his age, so you're you're buying into his free agency, and and eight years from now, what's the cap going to be? If we yeah, if no, we continue, it's going to look good. If we continue to grow, right? If the league continues to grow and that cap number continues to go up, eight looks like a bargain. The the thing that's always amazed me, and this is about every sport. Right, the way that the money grows and what you sign for, and we've had this discussion before, right? People are like, it's too much money. Like, you know, oh, poor Sidney Crosby signed for eight point seven million dollars. I would take eight point seven million dollars tomorrow. Um, you know, maybe we'll get a sponsor here, and I can get eight point seven million dollars. So go eight point seven million on a sponsor, or right? Eight point seven dollars. But it's always the way that players have measured themselves, right? There's two ways. There's stats. And then there's being rewarded for your stats. And and I always find it amazing as the money grows in all these sports that the poor poor guys, there's a pun right there, but the the players who were really good earlier have to watch the players that come behind them make as much money as them for not being as good of players just because of inflation and and the growth of the cap and the, the worth of the players. But there's no arguing you can't argue that Sidney Crosby and Lucas Raymond are equal in their value to their no. teams, but they're equal in their pay because the Detroit Red Wings are gambling that six years from now, that number's a bargain. Four, three years from now, that number's a bargain. The, that That's where the cap could be heading, right? I mean, if business stays good. And, and his listen, game. We talked about business. And his game. Yeah, and his game. We talked about business with Bill Daly. That interview is going to be uh, coming up later. He actually said that last season was maybe the best season in NHL history, Um, talent-wise, competition-wise, business-wise. So it's going to be hard to top, but that's what everybody's working towards. Bill Daly mentioned that, and that interview is coming up a little later in the episode. But uh, I guess I shouldn't be shocked with the Raymond contract because the comparable was Seth Jarvis. And if you take out the deferred money and all that, Jarvis's deal is an eight-year, $63.2 million deal, and Raymond's an eight-year, $64.6 million deal. So he just gets a little bit more, and that is the comparable. But you're, the teams are the, the Hurricanes, the Red Wings. They're buying in to these guys having bargain deals for them in two, three, four years based on where the cap's going to go. Uh Guys like Austin Matthews didn't want to buy into that. He's go. He went a little shorter, right? He went on a four-year deal. Leon Drysaddle's at a different point in his career. He goes on the eight-year deal, and he's getting fourteen million a year. I mean, so it's it's different where you're at, but the percentage of the cap for a guy like Raymond, the percentage of a cap for a guy like Jarvis, could look really good soon. And that's what teams are. That's how it's measured more than necessarily is he worth it now. It's going to be is he worth it later. Yeah, no, and look, and that's the gamble, right? And that's the that's the play that Steve Eisman's been making for years now, and it's time, right? It's time for all of those gambles and and all of that long term planning to show up and, and to become a reality. Yep. Well, I mean, listen, it almost became reality for the Edmonton Oilers last year. Well, it did become reality. They got the Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals, so who's arguing with that? They just fell a little short. But we talked with Leon Dreisaitl at the Player Media Tour, and we talk about contracts. He's got the biggest one right now, uh, $14 million a year and an eight-year deal that he signed this offseason. So he's got nine more years in Edmonton. He's hoping Connor McDavid does the same next year. McDavid's got two years left on his current deal. Let's get to that interview that we had with Leon Dreisaitl talking all things Oilers and McDavid and why he chose Edmonton for the rest of his career, basically. Leon, thanks for joining us. So I want you, if you can, to describe your love for the city of Edmonton. Obviously, you signed there. That's been news out for a while. And you've talked about what you, how much you like it. Like, what is it about Edmonton? Why? Why is it Edmonton for you? Um, I think when you, you know, get drafted somewhere, you create, uh, I've said this before too, you create a, a, a type of love for that team. And, and your original thought is that, 
you know, they wanted me and, um, you know, I want to pay it back for or, or to that team and I want to be with this team forever. I think that's always the initial thought of every player. And um, I think for me, it's just the passion that um, that the city brings towards hockey, towards us. And, um, you know, the people just admire us and, and, and they just love us so, so, so much and, and they support us and, um you know, I'm very, very happy. I take great pride in, in you know, wearing wearing the Oilers jersey and playing for our city. And, um, yeah, very happy to, to get that done. Seems like a lot of people have caught on to the way that you think me because it's become a place that wasn't very attractive to a place now that is very attractive. Yeah, I, I think that we've created that over the last couple uh, over the last couple seasons. Uh, you know, I think we've created a culture that... Um, you know, people want to be a part of, and um, y- you know, I think that everyone that that signs with us or or gets traded to us, you know, they always um, truly realize how um, how special we're treated in the first place. Our building, um, how how great care our ownership takes of us, um, how you know the the type of team we have, how tight we are, how how much we enjoy playing for each other, and. Um, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people want to be a part of. Of course, the biggest the biggest reason why people want to be on our team or players want to be on our team is I think you know we're uh, we got a great group and uh, we got a great team that that wants to win. You know, it's not your job or your business to talk about Connor and what what he does, but. From your perspective, we see Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. They get to play. It looks like they're going to get to play their whole careers together. How much would that mean to you? What would that mean to you to be able to do that with Connor? Clearly, his contract situation comes up, and that's not your business. It's his. But to to have that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it, it would it would mean the world to me. Um, you know, I love playing with him. Um I've, I've always loved, um, you know, learning from him and, and, you know, doing this together in a way and, and chasing it down together in a way. And, um, you know, obviously I'd be lying if I said that, um, you know, I don't want him there there forever. You know, I, I want him by my side. Um, I'm sure he, he thinks the same way. But like you said, at the end of the day, you know, he's going to do what's best for him. And, um, you know, that's the way this business works. But, um, yeah, just... Uh, I guess I guess I'm just waiting for for next summer for him. Yeah, <laughs> because of the emotion and the pressure and everything else that goes with it, is a relationship like you and Connor have almost deeper than a brotherhood? Yeah, I think I think we've just been through you know the identical things in a way. Um, you know, obviously there's always there's always more attention on Connor and and rightfully so. That's that's the way it's supposed to be. But in a way. Um, you know, we've gone through the same ups and downs in our organization. We're chasing the same things. Our priorities over time has, uh, ha- have changed together. And, um, I think we're, we're, we've just gone through a lot of the similar things in a way. And, um, you know, it's just amazing to have someone that understands you, that understands what you're feeling, understands what you're going through, um, and ultimately understands, me um as a person better than me as a player right he he knows me as a player but i think our relationship um is so special because i see when he's struggling he knows exactly what i need when i'm struggling and i think that's um something very special and uh, that you know we're we're very proud of you you've mentioned it a few times chasing it down so close obviously last year to getting the stanley cup i wonder what you know what did you go through when when you lost, and does that feeling stick with you? Is it is it motivation now, or because this is a new season, that's in the past? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think until you actually win it, um, this will always, uh, you know, stick with us. Um, and obviously, it was it's heartbreaking. Um, can't can't be much closer, of course, than 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 we were. And, um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're sitting here today and, and we're getting ready for a new season and a new opportunity for us to, to win it as a team. And, um, you know, obviously not a lot of, lot of new faces in our group and, um, we're going to have to find our, our identity and, 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 you know, create the team that we want to be, but, uh, it's a new challenge and we're excited for it. Do you just have to accept the cruelty 
that this game has for people? Yeah, I mean, cruelty, like, um, that's, you know, there, there's a lot bigger things in life yeah. than, than... But I mean, than, for your profession to... Yes, of, of course, yeah. I mean, you were literally in game seven, yeah. one shot away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a well, hundred games. Exactly. Um, it is, like, it's it's devastating, uh, you know, it's it's moments, it's, it's millimeters of... You know, what if, you know, we tie it up? There's all these what ifs that are going through your head, but that didn't happen. That That's not that's not the case right now. And, um, you know, you have to accept that. And, and I think you're you're bang on, you know, sometimes the sport or any sport, I think, can be really cruel and and hard and, and, and heartbreaking. But um, it's also what makes it special. You know, uh, we got a great group. We're 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 excited. We're hungry. And, you know, we want to get it done. Personally, what did you gain from last season? From the experience, not just of lo- not just of you know losing in Game Seven, but getting there. Um, yeah, a lot. I mean, I think we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, just the ups and downs of it, um, the the emotional roller coaster of it. Um, I think we're by now we're a very mature group that um, I would like to think knows uh, very well how to handle these things. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been in the situation that we were in. Um, but I think every season, in a way, just um, you know, creates its own adversity and its own storylines. And um, you know, like I said earlier, we're gonna have to find our identity. We got a lot of new faces. We're gonna have to find the way that uh, we we can play su- successful hockey. And hopefully, um, that's gonna be one step better than last year. One of the new faces that's not completely new because he came over last year's Corey Perry. You played a lot against Corey Perry before he came to you. He has a reputation around the league that he embraces that nobody wants to play against him, but everybody wants him as a teammate. In hockey, how do you how are you able to turn that off? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the 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 most fun part about the hockey world, I think. You know, there's so many guys that you battle against and you, that you just can't stand and um, you in a way get aggravated, um, you know, just looking at their face and then you get to meet them and you're like, wow, this is the best guy in the world and I would do anything for him, right? It, it's so funny how this game works that way. Um, and Paris is certainly one of those guys, you know, I've been in a playoff uh, series against him in, in seven games and, um, you know, I wanted to probably tomahawk my stick over his <laughs> his, his, his uh his head but now i would do anything for him because i know how good of a teammate he is how 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 much he cares about the game how he presents himself how he takes care of his teammates um you know he's a he's a really really great teammate and you know still a really good player so who's that guy now that you'd want to tomahawk your stick over his uh, head. I'm not going to I'm and not going to I'm going to give him the satisfaction. I, I ask it in a joking way but it's really the question is is there a player in this league that gives you fits? When you play against him, that it, it's just you give a lot of players fits. Is there a guy that gives you fits? Of course, there is. Um, there's too many to to just um, take pinpoint one right. guy, maybe. But uh, there's lots of guys that um, you know when you go up against them, you're a little bit more aware of them. Or you know, every player has that in their own way. You know, if you go up against Nate McKinnon, yeah, there's a more a different anticipation than when you go up against someone that'll run you through the boards, right? It's 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 different, and they all have their uh, unique ways of, um, you know, having you on on the edge of your seat. I got to ask you about Germany. Um, you went a couple of years ago with the Oilers, which had to be a career highlight, and now the NHL's going back, and and JJ Paterka is going with Buffalo. What does it mean, a that the NHL's going back to Munich? And and the profile of Germany is growing along with that. People are finally seeing what German hockey is, and, and you guys are delivering on the international stage as well. Well, first of all, I would like to go back to throw that out there to the NHL. <laughs> we'll, but, let, we'll let Steve Mayer know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, no, it's amazing. I think, um, you know, Germany has really uh, come along, and, and we've really created some really high-end product and, and some really high-end players in the NHL um, and you know it's it's amazing for the league to recognize that and 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 you know give give Germany a great game and a great great event in Germany um, new rink it's going to be a really special night uh, especially for JJ of course um, having having played for the team there and um, 
yeah, I'm sure uh, I'm sure it'll be very exciting. Who was your guy when you were a kid on the national team? They they weren't as well known as they are now. And now, if you go to Germany, everybody's going to be at you. It's JJ, whoever it is. But who was your national team hero? Uh, my national team hero is probably Marco Sturm. Um, that was probably the guy that I looked up to the most. Um, you know, obviously he was one of the best players that that we've had has come out of Germany and. Um, he was, uh, he was, yeah, he was just such a good player and someone that you know you've always wanted to be like, and been fortunate enough to, um, you know, been coached by by Sturmy and, and and got to know him pretty well, and um, just a just an, uh, a fantastic human being on top of that. So that was pretty cool. Why don't I switch subjects with you a little bit? Because Sean had asked me one time if you could pick any NHL player to live with, who would it be? Now I have a unique you have a unique perspective on this that i don't have obviously if you could had if you had to do it who would you if there anybody on the oilers that you had to do who would you live with if you had to live with the teammate and there's a lot that goes into this personality you know yeah live with oh cooking ability cooking is ability? a big one yeah, <laughs> yeah i'm gonna need that <laughs> <laughs> uh god um Man, that's a that's a really hard question. I was not prepared for this. No, you never <laughs> thought about that one. Right? No, no, never <laughs> thought of that one. Um, I, 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 maybe, maybe Connor, because um, I think we're very alike and very similar in in certain things, mm-hmm. and um, I think we we always, you know, we enjoy talking about hockey. We love the game. We love getting better. We love watching. So um, we love sports in general together, and. Um, I think he would be a pretty easy guy to uh, to live with. It, you were talking about Connor before too, and and I had thought of this. And now the way you just were talking about it here, if you guys weren't linked together with Edmonton, do you think you'd be buddies? Like because of the personalities that you have? Yeah, I mean, it it it's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of times, you know, be you become really close with with teammates or, or or people that you play with. You spend a lot of time with, right? Uh, it, friendships they take time to to develop but um definitely a, a character that i would probably uh gravitate towards you said you like sports in general what what's your go-to to get away from the nhl i think soccer probably um you know growing up in germany that's yeah. that's that common sense um uh, it's just so big back home and um yeah just a, a big sport that that you know, people people love, and uh, you know, I truly enjoy uh, playing, and I, I I enjoy watching. So when I get a raise, I always buy something for myself. <laughs> you got a raise? You got a bit of a raise? Are you, you going to buy a German soccer team or what? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> My raise wasn't big enough to buy a German soccer team. I can tell you that. A piece? You could be like Hedman. I could buy a piece, guys. but um, no. Uh, I don't know. Um, we'll see. We'll see what, <laughs> what comes up to mind. But as of right now, a soccer team is not on the list yet. <laughs> Leon, this was great, man. Thanks for stopping by. All right? Thanks, really man. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good stuff there with Leon Dry. So, Sean, I thought Leon was really open and he was relaxed. Uh, it, w- it was good. It's almost like even though they didn't win the Stanley Cup, just understanding that they went as far as they did and they proved a lot, of, proved a lot to a lot of people – while it motivates him to do more because they didn't get the job done, it did seem to relax him a little bit because two years ago, I remember at Player Media Tour, it wasn't the same, Leon Dreisaitl. No, and his life's changed a lot, right? He's he's financially secure for the rest of his life. Not that he wasn't before, but now you know that no matter what happens, you, you're set for life. Um, it's like winning the lottery. Um, and... He got really close to what his dream is of winning the cup, and he knows that Edmonton is a team that can do that now, right? There's proof. Before, it was all just kind of, oh, well, maybe, you know, I know I'm good. I know Connor's good. Um, maybe we have the other pieces here. But now he knows, right? They were within one goal of, of winning the cup, and if, if Sergei Bobrovsky wasn't so good early in the final, you know, maybe it's a different story. So... I think things are going really well for Leon Dreisaitl right now, and it, it's hard to be in that mindset of clawing, right? Like, I'm not saying he's not going to come into the season hungry, but it, it, it's just a different hungry um, because some of the other things that were kind of pushing at him are no longer there. 
You know what I like that he, he, the way he talked about his relationship too with McDavid. There's only a few people in the world that can understand Leon Draisaitl, and Connor McDavid's one of them. There's only a few people in the world that can understand Connor McDavid. Leon Draisaitl is one of them. That kinship, really, it's. I think it's a remarkable thing. I mean, they come from two completely different backgrounds, and you know, they're one one guy's from Germany, the other guy is you know Canadian. But hockey's united them, and it seems to me as that. And I asked them the question too: that even if they weren't teammates, it seems to me that they would still have that because they can have an understanding of what the other is going through. And ironically, McDavid's going to go through the exact same thing next summer as Leon Draisaitl did this summer, which is you're entering the last year of your deal, and you wanna do you wanna call Edmonton home for the rest of your career? Essentially, you know what it reminds me of. Well, it reminds me of two things, Dan. One is the Crosby-Malkin relationship. Yes. It's very similar. Very similar, different backgrounds, uh, an understanding of each other, an understanding of the pressure that each feels, an understanding of what they're trying to accomplish as a team that's united them and and made them very close friends over, you know, uh, almost two decades. And it reminds me of you and I. The relationship wow, that we nice. have, different backgrounds. Yeah, you know, you're from New Jersey. Unfortunately, I'm from New England. Um, you are now from New Jersey. We've had the, we had this argument in an Uber while we were in you Vegas. You lived in New Jersey longer than you lived in Rhode Island. I am not. You are from New Jersey. I will never be from New. Embrace. I will it. never be from New Jersey, and that is no slight on the fine state that I live in. I am from New England, and New England has shaped me. And you hear that whenever I get tired on the road because I start talking like a New Englander. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do. But <laughs> nobody can understand. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe one day we'll do the podcast in New England New Englandese. Um but it is. It's a unique relationship and it, it's a relationship that nobody can understand. I mean, look, everybody in that room are hockey players. There's some guys in that room that make a lot of money, but they're not Connor McDavid and they are not Leon Dreisaitl. Those are the guys. And you saw it last year. Every other day one of them spoke. They are the voices of the franchise. Yeah. They are the people that everybody wants to hear. Nobody gets all – I mean, people get upset when Darnell Nurse doesn't play well, but it's not to the same level as when Connor McDavid struggled. Oh. Remember Connor no, – they get, they get very upset when Darnell Nurse doesn't play well. But it's still – Because of the contract. I know, but it's still not to the same <laughs> level. Remember when Connor McDavid wasn't playing well at the beginning of the season? I went out there for the Heritage Classic, and, and the sky was falling. And, and it weighed yeah. heavily on Connor McDavid. He was not a happy human being because of the, the pressure that he puts on himself. And, and – and, you know, Leon Dreisaitl understands that, and I, I think they can live outside of that. I think they have their own little bubble that they can live in where, where each of them understands what the other one needs. And, and you just heard in an interview, Leon basically said that. Like, there's this almost telepathic, like it is on the ice, off the ice, I think there's almost this telepathic relationship of, I understand what you're going through. I understand that you're taking the heat right now, and I can help you with that. And, and, you know, when you have someone in your life, you know, that can do that, it's amazing. You know, whether it's a friend, whether it's a coworker, whether it's, you know, whoever, your parents, your spouse, it makes life a lot easier. It does. So, our relationship is is similar, except we disagree on the Edmonton Oilers. If you agreed with me all the time, you would be right, but it wouldn't be much fun. <laughs> well, this would be a very boring podcast if I agreed <laughs> with you all the time. Our relationship would be very boring if I agreed with you. You know what? If I agreed with you even some of the time, I think our relationship would be boring. But we don't agree a lot. And I definitely don't agree with you on the Edmonton Oilers. We're doing a Super 16 this week. It's a training camps or opening edition of the Super 16. Just flat out, where do we think these teams rank as camps are opening? I got the Edmonton Oilers at number one. They're one goal away from winning the Stanley Cup. They have the arguably the two best players in the league or two of the best players in the league. Their goaltender has proven to me that he can play big. The defense has been proven to me that it can play big the depth is strong you have them in number six why do you hate the Edmonton Oilers I don't hate the Edmonton Oilers I think they're the sixth best team in the league right now until they prove me wrong I just 
I don't. They just did I, prove I you don't wrong. believe in their goaltending. S- seriously, Why? would you pick their goaltender if you had to win a game seven? I'll tell you right now. Your Super 16 is Florida, Dallas, Florida 1, Dallas 2, Boston 3, the Rangers 4, Colorado 5, then Edmonton. You want to give me Bob? That's fine. Ottinger hasn't won it. Swayman, I love him. Shesterkin, yeah, I'd pick him. Definitely not Georgiev. I'd pick Skinner over Georgiev and probably Ottinger at this you, point. Look, you can flip-flop Colorado and Edmonton, right? They're right there with each other. But you didn't. You're, you put Edmonton, You put Colorado All right, them. so they're five, if not six. At that point, it doesn't matter. To me, they're not in the top four in part because of their goaltending. And you said he proved it. Uh, what did he prove? He, he The goal he gave up was awful. The, the Stanley Cup winning goal was awful. And for much of that series, he didn't have to be good. And in the beginning of the series, he wasn't good. So what did he prove? He helped get this team to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. And it was a roller coaster in, the whole way. In that Game 7, he allowed two goals. One, they lost one of which one. was atrocious. When the chips were down and they were down three to nothing in that series. Now I understand he wasn't very good in the first uh three games of that series. He was way better. Game he was way better after that. And he came back. He proved that he is a battler, that he can get it done. What did he do against Dallas? He came back after one bad game and proved he can get it done. Time and again, Stuart Skinner proved it. Time and again, he proved it. I don't agree. I I, I thought in watching him play that it was an adventure all the time. And yeah, he had some great games and he had some really bad games. But when you look at him, and I think, look, I think he's going to be a really good goaltender. He has limited experience for a Stanley Cup goaltender. Just went to game seven in the Stanley Cup final. What more experience do you want? It's just not repeatable. What he does hasn't become repeatable yet as a goaltender. All right, so you want to see him repeat, prove the. I can no, get that. No, but I'll, by I what I mean by repeatable is he doesn't play the same game, game to game. Like when you watch Bob or or Shosturkin, you watch Shosturkin all the time. He has bad. He's better than Skinner. He, uh, he has bad games. Rarely, but yeah. he does. Yeah. But his game is repeatable. When you watch him play, whether it's his first game of the year, his 13th game of the year, his 42nd game of the year, game five of the playoffs, it's the same game. You know what you're going to get. When you watch Skinner play, who, who knows? Do you get game seven Skinner or do you get game one through three Skinner? You don't know yet. We don't know yet. I can I, I can understand that. But I also look at the rest of the team. You have two elite players in McDavid and Drysaddle. You have an elite shot on your back end in Bouchard. A guy who I think is an elite defender in Matthias Ekholm, right? Nurse is maybe not to the level of $9.25 million a year, but he's still a pretty darn good defenseman that you can trust. You look at their depth. Hyman, Zach Hyman's a, just a flat-out goal scorer. Nugent Hopkins, Victor Arvidsson, Adam Henrique. They added Jeff Skinner. Corey Perry's still there. I mean, there's a lot to like with this team. And now toss in the, the bitterness that they feel I, I I honestly think that it's Edmonton. I think we're back in Edmonton in June, and I think they're celebrating. Dude, you're you're acting like I put them at number twenty seven. They're an elite team, and and look, the Florida Panthers proved it wrong last year because they came back from losing the final and won, but they were decimated in the final. They were never in that final. Historically, not against Vegas. No, in Vegas. No. Historically, yeah. in the history of this league. The loser of the Stanley Cup final is in for a rough time. You don't come back. We'll see about that. But we do know that Stanley Cup final was phenomenal, nearly historic. Well, it was historic, but it was almost even better than that. Uh, The season last year was terrific. Business looking up. 
We talked to Bill Daly at the NHL Player Media Tour last week in Las Vegas, and and he touched on a lot of those things, including um, the reaction, obviously, to the tragedy with uh, the passing of Johnny Gaudreau and his brother Matthew, and Utah jumping into the league. Here is our interview with Bill Daly. We have Bill Daly with us. Thanks for joining us, Bill. We're here in Vegas. How, how's your trip been so far here? Uh, short. Uh, so far, so good. No, I got in last night, um, uh, I don't know, around uh, dinner time. And uh, I've had a full day of uh, media activities today. And uh, do a little bit tomorrow and then uh, fly out. Bill, look, obviously the last week plus the, the NHL community has been grieving. Um, the hockey community has been grieving along with the Gaudreau family, but it's it's one of those things. It's tragic. It's awful. But what have you seen in terms of the hockey community rallying around this family? And it probably doesn't surprise you, but when you see it, what do you feel? Yeah, no, there. You know, I uh, went to the funeral yesterday uh, in Media, Pennsylvania, and it was an enormous outpouring of uh, love and support uh, for the Gaudreau family. Um, it was it was a tough uh, it was a tough funeral to sit through for sure. Uh, but to your point, uh, I think it, it evidenced um, you know how the hockey community can come together in support of tragedies like this. Um, and uh, there was so much love in that building. It was uh, it was moving for sure. And uh, yeah, we. Uh, lost two wonderful young men and and um uh, we're always gonna remember them and honor them and and uh i believe the hockey community will step up to that challenge as well it's hard to change the subject but i, I want to ask you you've been a part of this very much like me since the very beginning of the player media tour from very humble beginnings in a hotel in new york to to this extravaganza here it's kind of grown as the league's grown, and, and and I'm wondering if you, for people who aren't too, f- too familiar with it, if you can explain what we gather here for. Well, it's, it's become really um, instrumental in our ability to kind of promote um, various elements of our season and of our, our game and of our teams. Um, as you mentioned, it was, you know, when we started this, uh, it was a handful of players, a handful of the league star players who we had to kind of coerce or persuade um, to come to a central location to do some media. So when we started this, um, you know, it was it was not, uh, as, as you mentioned, it wasn't anything like what we, we see today. Um, I think we have 32 or 33 players uh, here in Las Vegas. We had about 20 uh, in Prague for the Europe. Uh, media tour. It's been uh, something that all of our stakeholders, including our rights holder, but also our non-rights holders, uh, rely on on an annual basis to, to gather content uh, and to help us promote the start of our season. To me, it's always, you said at the start of the season, to me, this player media tour, wherever it's been in New York, Chicago, Vegas, it always represents the start of the season. It, it, yes, it feels like last season just ended, but it always represents the start of the season. What are you excited about as we start this season? Well, I mean, look, it's it's we're coming off of kind of maybe our best season ever uh, in 23-24. So it's going to be a tough act to top. Um, but that's what we're all striving to do. Uh, I think the the game on the ice has never been better, never been more skilled. Uh, I expect uh, that dynamic and, and that evolution to continue this year. Uh, obviously, we have our, our games in Europe. Um, we're opening an arena in Munich. Uh, we're playing in Winter Classic in Wrigley Field uh, again for a second time. Uh, iconic baseball stadium, which has been uh, changed a lot since the last time we played there. Uh, obviously, a stadium series game in Ohio State University, uh, a, a, a very, very big game. Uh, and we have a, a like a historic record uh, that we're all kind of on watch uh, to see how it unfolds in, in the next several months with Alex Ovechkin. Uh, when and uh, I would say if and when, uh, but it's going to be when, uh, when he surpasses uh, that Wayne Gretzky mark, making him the, the highest goal-scoring uh, individual in league history, which is going to be a tremendous event for the league, a, a tremendous platform to kind of raise awareness uh, 
uh, of the league and the game uh, around the world. Yeah, I, just hearing your answer, I, I did wonder, relief is not the right word because you're always working. You're always working ahead. But as we enter this season, you're not answering questions about international hockey. There's the Four Nations. There's a World Cup upcoming. We know about the Olympics. You're not answering questions about the Arizona Coyotes. They're in Utah now. Uh, there's a few other things. The relationship with the PA seems good. I mean, like, is there a bit of relief that you that this is all kind of now in place? Well, what I'd say is, um, you know, last year I mentioned it may have been our best season ever. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into that, right? And it starts with the game on the ice and the quality of the game on the ice and how competitive it was and how great our playoffs were and a seven-game Stanley Cup final and record viewership. All of those go into it. You also want to and need to kind of minimize the noise around the game. Uh, and some of the things you mentioned have been noise historically over time. Um, so I think one of the remarkable things about last year was – uh, I, I think part of our success was minimizing uh, the noise around the game that sometimes happens. Sometimes it's inevitable. Sometimes you can't control. Um, uh, but you do your best to, to manage it and deal with it the best you can. Um, and I, I would say from my perspective in my chair, my seat, we had less of that last year of that exterior stuff uh, than we've had, ever had in my 27 years uh, at the league. So uh, hopefully, knock on wood, we'll we'll have another another one of those years. I want to backtrack to Ovi for a minute because it is an amazing storyline, and and I have two questions for you in regard to that. When did you realize that he could maybe do this? Because for a long time, even John Carlson we had on yesterday was like, "Oh, it was always the untouchable record." And then Ovi just kept putting together fifty goal seasons, and all of a sudden, people are like, "Well, maybe." And now, like you said, it's it's. If it's when, not if. And then also, this is the 20th season for both him and Sidney Crosby. You were a part of the league when each of them came in and there were such high expectations. Have they even outlived those expectations? Uh, I think by leaps and bounds, right? Um, just, I mean, we're so fortunate as a, as a league to have had them at the time we had them. All right? Think back to it. It's coming out of a year-long lockout, and, and we had – um, we had to deliver to our fan base um, and and show uh, show the world that the league is is coming back better than ever, not not uh, diminished. And they helped us do that. Um, and they've they've uh, always stepped up to the plate to to accept that responsibility and to shoulder that burden and to support the league as as unbelievable ambassadors for the 20 years that they've played. Um, and they both have different skill sets. Um, but both are, are incredibly compelling and uh, skill sets that have really helped raise the game uh, uh, to levels that uh, some people thought we'd never achieve. So Sean's <clears> question, <throat> what about with Ovechkin? When did you realize that this record? Oh, the question I didn't yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did the you know double what? question, he always the, bad. I, I, I would say I, I was not a believer. Um, I mean, I, I was like, I guess, hopefully everybody else until – you know, maybe three years ago, and I'm like, I'm like, he, he could actually get there. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, I would say in the last two years, I've, I've I've been a believer. 41 goals, I think that's the number that he that he needs right now. Uh, let's switch. I mean, listen, we, we briefly touched on it. I, I mentioned it. Utah gets going this season. Uh, it was it's been a transition. What have you seen from them? Uh, how how do you think they've transitioned from from the Arizona Coyotes now to to Utah to the Utah Hockey Club? Uh, what do you what do you expect from this? Uh, well, they've done a fantastic job uh, to this point. Um, you know, they they uh, they guaranteed us that they have the ability to do this, and they pulled this off, and uh, they've they've met every promise um, and uh, along the way, and they've made unbelievable. Uh, you know, accomplishments this summer in terms of gearing up, getting ready to play. Uh, I know there's incredible enthusiasm among the players uh, to get this going. I think they have a really good hockey team. I think they have a chance to be competitively successful, a good a good chance to be competitively successful. I think the fan base uh, in around Salt Lake City area is energized uh, to embrace them. You saw that. Uh, just with the introduction of the franchise a couple months ago, uh, it's going to be that times uh, you know threefold, fourfold 
when they actually start play. So it's it's exciting. It's exciting for them. It's exciting for the National Hockey League. Is there a way to quantify what they've done this summer? Like it's kind of all happened in the background. Everybody went to their cottages and to the beach and – they became a hockey team. I mean, they were one, but they've moved to a completely new place. They've sold out their arena. All the things that are in place for every other team in the league that run themselves, they never had the opportunity to do. And now we're here in September. And we're like, oh, Utah's going to play. So I'd say they've done and accomplished more than anybody else ever has, uh, right, in that in that vein. Um, and you're right. You point out, you know, there wasn't a whole lot uh, to work with. I mean, obviously they had the team intact and they brought the hockey operations group over. Uh, but everything else they were doing from scratch. And they were doing from scratch not knowing uh, that they'd have the opportunity to open uh, for next year until kind of very late in the process. So... Um, the closest one I can, you know, uh, cite would be the Winnipeg Jets and their transition from Atlanta to Winnipeg um, over the summer. But Mark uh, Chipman uh, had been working on that actually for a while and, and had the ability and had a, a hockey organization up and running with the Manitoba Moose at the time. Uh, so he had the people he could he could uh, reposition uh, uh, to help accomplish it. So. Um, what what's happened in uh, uh, Utah at this point is 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 truly amazing, um, and I know they're going to be successful. And the last time we were here in Vegas a couple of months ago for the draft and the awards was really their introduction. You know, their their first introduction to the NHL scene. It was also, by all accounts, a very successful draft, unique draft as well. At Sphere, did it change minds? Do you think? on uh, what to do with the draft going forward? So, I mean, I have not heard any kind of formal movement um, and, and kind of like, let, let me start by, uh, let me back up by saying that, you know, the, the, the whole idea about the form of the draft and, and where we have it and how we hold it, um, you know, that was an issue that was put on our radar screen by our clubs. Um, there were a number of clubs who were strongly in favor of changing the format of the draft, make it a decentralized draft, similar to some how other uh, some other professional sports leagues operate. Um, and uh, quite frankly, you know, we put it to a poll of our ownership and and of our clubs. Um, some some hockey operations people make the decisions for for the draft, and some business people make the decisions for the draft, and some owners make the decision for the draft. But when <clears throat> we canvassed the entire league and one vote per club, it was pretty overwhelming uh, that we were moving to a decentralized draft. Um, then we we get to the sphere here in Las Vegas. We wanted to go out with a with a bang. Uh, I think we were successful in doing that. It was a very unique experience. It was a great experience. I think most of our clubs loved it. Um, having said that, I, I think, um, you know, the plans remain in place and, and, you know, the current planning for next year involves having a decentralized draft. Bill, I'm curious, you know, we talked about some of the big events, uh, the Winter Classic, having the, the draft here at the Sphere, other things that have gone on. Other leagues have followed suit with some of these things the ufc is going to be in the sphere this week having an event the national basketball league has done games outdoors all those things that have gone on is, is there a little bit of quiet pride when when you see ideas that the nhl's had transform into other sports um sure but you know i i think we all kind of learn from each other um and there are creative people working at all the different professional sports leagues and entities um, and, you know, we all uh, have open eyes and open ears to, to new ideas. Um, you like when you're the first. Um, and fortunately for us, we've been, uh, we've often been the first, first in recent years. And, and that's uh, certainly a source of pride for sure. Bill, I think Sean and I could sit here all day and ask you questions, but you've got a schedule to keep. So we really appreciate you stopping by and giving us a couple of minutes. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Sean, great stuff there with Bill Daly. He touched on Utah. You saw Utah's first game. I don't want to say it's an official. I guess it's an official game. You were there when the jerseys came out and Utah Hockey Club came out on the ice from the rookie showcase in El Segundo. They lost. Macklin Celebrini scored. They lost. But you were at the first ever Utah Hockey Club game. What'd you think? I thought it was awesome. It's always awesome to be a, a little part of history, right? And look, they're going to make bigger history. They're going to play their first preseason game soon after their first training camp. And then they're going to play their first regular season game. And then we're going to break out the big guns because I'm not going to do it. 
Nick Kostanik is going to do <laughs> it. You know, Tracy's going to do some of training camp, Tracy Myers. So, you know, I started the ball rolling, but now now Leandro Isettle and Connor McDavid are coming over the boards. Corey, Corey Perry. That's not true. Corey you're, Perry's you're going to sit. Allowing other, you're just allowing other people to get into the game. You're just playing the depth. Yeah, yeah, That's all sure. you're doing. But it was phenomenal, right? And I and I talked to Bill Armstrong, their GM, while that first game was going on, and I was like, they wore their black uniforms, um, with the blue and the white trim. And I'm like, what do you think about those uniforms? And he's like, they're smooth. And they are. That's what they. they that's are. what they are. I like. They're them. smooth, yeah. and they were smooth. The 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 Utah Hockey Club was smooth, like. I understand that all the assets came from Arizona and, and you know, it, it's not the Vegas Golden Knights, um, but in a lot of ways, it's almost more difficult. And Bill Daly talked about it a little bit in his interview, um, you know, just how difficult a summer this was. And, and, and you know, Armstrong talked about that, too. He, he was like, you know, we, we had to settle everybody in the summer. He was basically while he was trying to build a hockey team, he was basically a guidance counselor for his whole staff. They all went yeah. to to travel agent. Yeah, yeah all they all stuff. went to yeah. Utah. And, and look, nobody wants to move. I've lived in the same place now, you know, for fifteen years, and and I have nightmares about in New Jersey about ever in New yes, Jersey in New Jersey about ever ha- in Central Jersey, no less. I have nightmares about moving trucks, and and when I finally have to leave this place, nobody wants to move, and, and nobody wants to move unexpectedly, and there's all kinds of setbacks, so he spent the whole time, you know, dealing with that, trying to get an organization organization up and running um, off the ice while being competitive on the ice, so there hasn't been a lot of sleep, and but you wouldn't know it, right? And they're going to be doing stuff right up to the opening faceoff and probably beyond as far as building their organization and the support that they need in Utah. Um, but it was awesome to see. And, and you know, I've done some of these tournaments in the past. I've done Traverse City when it was at its height, when it was eight teams. Sadly, it's down to two now, which it, it to me is awful because that was always a highlight. I've done the Buffalo tournament, which seems to grow every year. I'm trying to convince Bill Price, our boss, to let me do the Pentitkin tournament one of these times because that Ooh. just looks beautiful but the 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 la tournament which moves every year amongst those teams amongst the seven teams um was fantastic and i'll tell you one thing we talk about how young this league is going to be and how young this league is it's going to get even younger there was some really 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 good talent on display um over those four days in in, in la and the the tickets were limited because it's not a huge building, their practice facility. Um, but the people that got in there, they saw a show. And the, the scouts that got in there with contracts in their pockets, the scouts in the stands with contracts in their pockets, they saw a show yeah. too. Um, it was it was fantastic. It was, for a hockey nut, it was like heaven. You know what's interesting? And, and real quick, I mean, Macklin Celebrini uh, obviously scores in his debut uh, we're going to see a lot from him. Jumbo, Joe Thornton was in attendance along with Mike Greer. But you mentioned it at the top. Uh, you wrote about it too. Cutter Gauthier. Uh, so, Sean, before we get out of here, Cutter Gauthier puts on the 20 pounds, not not of pizza and ice cream, puts on the 20 pounds of muscle. Uh, and he's got a huge chance here with the Anaheim Ducks. I know the Philadelphia fans are always going to boo him. They're always not going to like him. And it is what it is. But he's got a big chance with a young group here in Anaheim. And, Sean, I was looking at this team. I don't think they're going to be very good this year, but man, they're on the right path with Carlson, with Gautier, Zegris, if he can really figure it out, McTavish, Troy Terry still in his prime, right? I mean, you got you got a couple of defensemen who are really young and good. You got a goalie who's pretty, I mean, they're doing the right things there. And I think, look, I mean, the look of this guy, Gautier, looks like he's going to be a huge part of it. Yeah, and, and you know, I didn't see the games on Monday because uh, I was flying home, but on Sunday, they played San Jose, right? And it's always going to be a California rivalry game, and it starts right at the rookie level. That was the chippiest game out of the eight or nine that I saw, and Gautier was right in the middle of it. You know, he really looks like an NHL player. And 
you know, in talking to him, you know, he talked about the weight and he said that he kept it tight because I, I did. I joked with him. I'm like, you're probably one of like 2% of people in the world that get on a scale and hope the number goes up. I pray for the number to go down right. every time I step on the scale. Yeah. Um, and he's like, look, I kept it tight. Like, I really had to work. It's hard work to put on weight. You have to eat the right food. You have to work out more. You have to sleep more. Um, he's like, and I did all that. And now it's going to pay off. And, 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 you know, but I also talked to him about feeling at home because he played the one game in Anaheim last year after he got done just terrorizing the NCAA. Um, he played one game and he's like, you know, the, the, it was the last game of the year. So there were some mile markers and whatever, but he also feels at home and he feels like the trades behind him. He's like, I, you know, I still get messages about people being unhappy. The volume has died down a little bit, but the, he says he's grown from it mentally you know, that's something that he said no kid should have to go through, no 18-year-old should have to go through. And it is something that no 18-year-old should have to go through. It's hockey. I love it. We make our living off of it. It's not life and death. And it's not death. And what happened to Cutter Gautier since the trade in the past nine months has been horrendous. And for him to come out the other side and feel stronger physically and mentally, the league better watch out. Yeah, literally 6 2 two, ten. It is hockey, uh, but they're fans. And they, you know, fans have a right. right? They don't have so that right. They, they, no, they don't have that right. But fans have a right to be uh, upset with a guy who doesn't want to play for their team. Listen, it's past him. He got through it. That's great. You know he's going to get booed when he goes to Philadelphia. Live with it. That's it. Move on. He's an Anaheim Duck, and they've got a bright future. But you know what, Sean? Rookie tournaments are over. Training camps are coming up. Guys are getting on the ice Wednesday and Thursday this week. Here we go. We're going to have preseason games coming at you. I'm gonna, a, week from, a week from today, I'm going to be on my way to the Global Series, Munich and Prague. Before you know it, Sabres and Devils are going to be opening the season in, in, in Prague, and away we go. I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. And, and when we do this podcast next, things are going to change a lot again, right? There's still, yeah. there's still free agents out there, both unrestricted free agents that can help teams, you know, you saw uh, Van Reems like sign yesterday in, in, in Columbus. They need help, um, and I think he can help them. And then there's unrestricted free agents. The biggest one is Swayman, and by the time our producer puts this piece together, he could sign in Boston, but he hasn't signed in Boston. And they don't have a goal. They traded Allmark. This is the first time, according to Kevin Paul DuPont um, yesterday on X, that the Bruins – could open a season without a goalie that has played at least one minute with the franchise the previous season since Vashon and, and Craig. That's ridiculous. Get him in camp. Get him signed. He's got to be there. And you know what? He will be there. He will be. He wants to be a Bruin. They'll get it done. Camps are opening. We're done with this. But we'll be back next week. Enjoy the hockey.